Our last speaker is Anthea Foyer, and she is the project lead of Smart City Mississauga. Throughout her time at the city, she has been the curator of digital public art and digital strategist for the culture division. She has also worked in planning and building, helping to develop their digital strategy. Prior to this, Anthea was the founder of a digital narrative company and led a collaborative residency program at the CFC Media Lab. As well, she has mentored and advised on a diverse projects ranging from community building and urban issues to the arts as well as entertainment. She is currently the co-chair of the Board of Inter-Access Media Arts Centre, as well as a board member for the Department of Imaginary Affairs. She also has a visual art and storytelling practice. Welcome, Anthea. and such a nice mix of both people from government and from the community. I think that's a great place for you guys to start. Um, so I'm starting out here with Mississauga is a smart city for everyone. So this is the tagline that we really live by and you'll be able to see that as I go through a presentation about our, our plan. But I'm gonna start with a story about the near future. So just excuse me as I read it off here, but I think this will really help you to kind of visualize what it feels like to live in a smart city. So I want to introduce you to Jacinta and Mohammed. They have two children. They have Phil, who is a teenager, and they have their little one, a six-year-old named April. So what does a typical day in a smart city look like for these people? The alarm goes off. Jacinta wakes up and sleepily asks her voice-activated AI assistant what the weather will be like today. Good morning, Jacinta, it says. It's gonna be 25 degrees outside. So Jacinta decides it's a perfect day for a bike ride. The AI assistant uh, encourages her to use her bike and she uses the assistant to book herself a city shared bike as they are often all taken by the time she gets there. She nudges her husband to get up and reminds him that it's their son's day to take out the garbage. I think probably a similar morning for a lot of people out there. Um, Mohammed wakes their son, Phil, and reminds him about his chores. Five more minutes, Dad. He mumbles in his sleep. I don't think garbage pickup is today. I'm, I'm sure it's not today, Dad. Mohammed asks the AI device to connect this to the city's 311 service and asks about garbage pickup days. As the AI cheerfully uh, confirms, today is, in fact, garbage day. Uh, Mohammed nudges his son to get a move on. As he is grabbing a quick breakfast, Mohammed checks his city app to see where he can plug in his electric vehicle, close to where he'll be meeting uh, his clients this day. The app also shows him the quickest route and how to avoid any road construction. Jacinta uses this time to sign their daughter April up for drawing lessons at a local community center and to download some e-books she has been meaning to read. Phil drags the garbage to the curb and then goes to wait with his friends for the autonomous shuttle that will take them all to school. April trails behind reluctantly. They both use the free Wi-Fi at the bus stop and on the shuttle. Phil to text his friends, April to play games, and look up facts about her favorite animal, the giraffe. While at work, uh, Jacinta and Mohammed get a text reminder about a local meeting and about a new development in their neighborhood that night. They are directed to a variety of digital tools that will help them make an informed decision about how this new building will impact their street. This includes an augmented reality app uh, that they can use to clearly visualize in 3D what this building will look like in their neighborhood in context of the other buildings that are there. After dinner, they start the long process of tucking April into bed. April negotiates three stories from her parents and two more from the AI assistant, which is part of the library program that reads bedtime stories from their collection. Phil and his friends received texts saying that the basketball court they had been waitlisted for at their local park had an opening slot for tomorrow. They send back their confirmation and invited a few more friends to join them. Mohammed worked on an online course that the city's small business center offered to upgrade his skills, while Jacinta wound down for the night by watching a streaming movie off the library's website. 
So these are all of the technologies in that story. Um, so some of these are things we have in Mississauga, some are coming, and some are ones that we've heard about or we're dreaming about. Um, but what I wanted that story to really show is that technology is really there to support the way that we already live. It's, there are beautiful, amazing, cool, shiny objects out there, and they're great. But as a government, it's really important to be able to make sure that whatever we choose are really enhancing the quality of life. So why this, why now? Why did we choose to be a smart city? So we've already talked a little bit about the challenge, but that really was the impetus for Mississauga. So uh, when we were planning for the challenge, we also knew that we'd be writing a smart city plan. So the challenge was really an opportunity for us to work with our community and work with other city staff to really start to imagine what this would look like for us. Um, and the, the other winning communities, I mean, if you have a chance, I mean, there was 130 communities that got involved. And it's amazing to read all of them. And for me, actually, some of the five and $10 million um, applications were really interesting. $50 million was amazing, of course. Um, but the smaller ones really gave you these very uh, creative and very um, city-specific projects. And so they're just really interesting in terms of, of looking at, at what people are thinking about across the country, what's important to their communities. So where are we now as a city in Mississauga? So we're already a smart city. So Mississauga's really young. We're maybe 40, 45 years old. Um, and we've had this uh, really, really um, prescient uh, IT director who has been building the infrastructure, the digital into the infrastructure for years. So uh, Peel Region, so which Mississauga is part of, we actually have our own internet, <laughs> which is kind of weird. So uh, I, think we're, I think we're the largest publicly owned network in Canada, or sorry, in North America. And so what that means is that we have an internet that our city runs on, our hospitals run on, and our post-secondary education runs on, and I think it saves us about $2 million a year. Um, so that could only be built because we were actually building the city at the time, so, it would, so we could build the fiber as we built. And as we build new developments, we work with our planning and building department to get the cable laid as we go. Uh, we were one of the first cities to put in um, LED lighting systems. We have an Internet of Things network across the city that's now across, I think it's like 750 um, traffic stops across the, the, the city. So we have this kind of incredible digital infrastructure to work with, which we're very lucky to have. Um, and as we move to the future, uh, our plan is to just kind of continue this because this has already been a part of the culture of build within Mississauga. Uh, the one thing that, so I was brought onto this project about a year, year and a half ago, and as you can see from my background, part of it is really around telling the stories, and it's because we have this amazing IT team doing this amazing work, and they don't know how to tell anybody. So I came in, <laughs> and I was like, how do people not know we have our own internet? That's insane. Uh, so that's part of my job, is to be able to tell people that we have these things. Uh, so how will we get there? So, um, I'm going to read this, I'm not going to read all my slides, but I think this one's really important. So this is the vision that we came up with. So, Mississauga will harness the creative power of new technologies and innovative ideas to enhance quality of life in Mississauga. We will effectively integrate physical, digital, and human systems in a built environment to deliver a sustainable, prosperous, and inclusive future. A smart city for everyone. And so why I think this is important is that it's really, again, going back to this idea of quality of life. If we're gonna spend time, money, and resources, it has to enhance quality of life for people that live, work, and play in Mississauga. And then to go a little bit further, this is the, the, the way that we're also looking at it. So um, Mississauga's initiatives are about transformational city building and creating vibrant, inclusive communities. So we really want these tools, we want to be able to uh, encourage all the other things that are already great about happening in the city and see how we can enhance those. Um, we want to serve as a model of government-led smart city urban development. And what we mean by this is that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of money in smart cities right now. Uh, I think by 2025 it's estimated that there'll be like something like $275 billion around the world of investment in smart cities. Everyone wants in, from developers to tech companies. 
and, and some of the things we're watching with, with sidewalk labs is, is around really the, this, this distance between what the people want um, and what the government and the companies want. So what we're trying to do is really have a citizen-led, government-led plan that will really help us uh, make sure that the values of, of the people that live in our city are the ones that get um, followed through with our, our digital directives. Um, and people-centered and neighborhood-focused is always really important for us as well. Um, and, and even by telling that story at the beginning, what we have to keep reminding ourselves of, what are our objectives? And our objectives are the people that live in our city. So as you can see from our smart city goals, these aren't really particularly technological. Um, again, they're really around looking at how we can focus on our government, environment, mobility, living, economy, and people. Um, and I think you could see from the Smart City Challenge from Infrastructure Canada, the goals that they were looking for were very similar. They were quality of life. They were around prosperity, environment, government. And, and as you look around the world, sort of contextually, most of the, the um, there's sort of these stages of smart city development. And the first stage tends to be really focused on technology. And then the second one is really where governments start to lead. And then the third one is really where the community becomes a really big part of the process. And around the world, you can kind of see this push and pull happening, which is a very healthy push and pull. You kind of put something out into the world, you see how the decisions react, and it can go back and forth. I mean, one of the things I love about your community is that I think it's amazing that this, of, this group of people from your community were the ones that have organized this and are really pushing for it, because that collaboration is incredibly important. Uh, and then the framework we're working within is really around sort of being prepared for the future, um, being open, collaborative, preparing for the everyday, uh, being data-centric, and being connected. So in this one, you can start to see a little more technology language in there around the connected. Um, but my boss likes to joke that our smart city plan is really a continuous uh, improvement plan for projects. So as you loop through the, each of these, the idea is that um, it's integrated into all of the systems and processes that we have within our government. So as we're working through each project, we, um, we ask that all of these things are considered as every tech project goes through. Um, things like being collaborative is, is, there's no other way to work with smart cities. As I think both the, the gentleman before me mentioned, everything is connected to everything, and it's true. And one of the most uh, amazing things about smart cities is it's this really great problem solving because uh, digital is not everything now, so it really, creates this opportunity for us to look at the complex systems that are our cities and start to, to dream of new ways to, to connect them. So I just wanted to show this as one of the examples of how we're working with all of the other departments in the city because we always also wanted to make sure that, again, we weren't just creating these kind of neat, shiny objects, but that each of our digital projects really relate back to the core of the other projects that our city is doing. So um, our Smart City Plan connects to 27 plans or strategic plans from all our, our divisions across the city. Um, this map here, which I'll tell you a little bit more about our living labs in a second, but this maps out where our living labs are. They also relate back to where our culture districts are. They relate to where our tourism districts are. They relate to where our planning and building has decided we need more int intensification nodes. Um, we just really wanted to make sure that as we're doing this, again, it's all connected to all of the other projects, so it serves as an enhancement to, to all the, um, the activities happening in our city. So the living labs. So we've set up five living labs across the city. So they're in our four business um, improvement areas and then along with our downtown as well. And the idea behind a living lab is really um, both making it kind of neighborhood focused, but also places where both we as the city can kind of test projects out, but also where the public can come and try things as well. We want to make sure with our Smart Cities project that everything is very transparent and it's very much part of the public realm. This is one of the big shifts between how IT used to work and how IT or digital is now working. I, I, traditionally in, in uh, governments, it was really the IT department was a support system to the people working within the organization, but now digital is fully in the public realm. I don't know any vendor that comes to, to our city, whether they're talking about building a road, uh, dealing with a bus, planting trees that doesn't have a digital component to it. So digital is very much in the public realm. So our smart city plan is really trying to kind of address that 
and provide opportunities um, both for us as the, the government to be there, but also for the citizens to be able to have opportunities to, to see what it is and have input on each of these projects. Um, so this uh, screen on the right is an example of a quick project we did. So um, we were, our master plan was um, endorsed by council just a couple of months ago, so just in June. So we're just uh, kind of ramping up with our projects, but this summer our planning and building department uh, did a tactical urbanist project on one of our streets to kind of test out some new ideas and invited us to be involved. So uh, we thought, okay, great, let's get a screen. So we got a digital screen and we were just testing out um, if it was the right place for it, what were the right tools on it. It was a very kind of just quick project to just be within one of our living labs and have people be able to see and feel what that looks like and then get their input as well. It also provided us an opportunity to work with other departments, going back to that collaborative nature. So even within this screen, the top image is something as uh, a video from our public art department. Um, we have our downtown strategy plan. They have a, they were doing a survey, so that was on there. Our Celebration Square in Mississauga, which is a big event square, we had their event schedule and then information about smart cities. So just again, trying to sort of test out new ways that we can keep collaborating with each other. Um, so the, another area that we were looking at was innovation challenges. So I'm not sure how many of you have either issued or replied to um, a, uh, a call for interest from the cities, but it tends to be quite an onerous and bureaucratic process, which I'm sure you know. So currently, you know, we'll sort of say, hey, here's a problem, here's a solution, here's an enormous form to fill out. And so what happens is often we've already decided the solution. So first, we're not opening ourselves up for new opportunities for solutions. And the other thing, by making it so onerous, it often leaves out some of the smaller, more innovative companies. So a lot of cities have actually been doing these innovation challenges. So we're looking at um, Dublin and Amsterdam and also locally London, Guelph and Barrie, I think, are doing this as well. So the idea is that you put out an innovation challenge to the community. So it might sort of say, we have localized flooding in this area, this community has some concerns about security, whatever the, the issues are in that neighborhood. And then you provide the opportunity for, for companies to come to you. And so we're trying to set it up in a cluster model where there is a big company, an innovative company, and they have to come in as a partnership. And then um, from our side, we'll be working with new Canadians and students and adding them to the team as well. So each one of those teams will come up with a prototype and we'll give you know a little bit of money to each of those. Those prototypes will be set up in real space so that we can see them and the public can see them and the whole process will be transparent. And then we've actually worked with our procurement department to sort of change the bylaws a little bit so that this actually counts as a procurement process and we can scale up if one of these projects is working. So if we look at these four prototypes, we think it's working, the public likes it, we can scale it up and, and stretch it out across the city. So we're really excited to be, to be launching that this fall. And then the Center for Civic Curiosity. So where this came from was, so I, we did a long process of engagement for our, our challenge, um, and then we did a long process of engagement to create our master plan as well. Um, and every time, I've done a lot of public engagement for arts and culture, activism, planning and building, all sorts of things. And I have never had a more positive group of people. So everyone that came was so excited, so invested. We actually couldn't get them to leave because they kept wanting to talk, which was wonderful. Uh, and they really, really wanted to be involved in these conversations. Because um, they're big conversations. Digital is changing the way that we live, we work, we think. It changes our politics. It's changing our, the way we are socially. These are huge conversations. And, and we don't know the answers, and nobody quite knows the answers. So the way that we thought we would set that up was setting up the Center for Civic Curiosity, where we can just have big public conversations. So the current one we're working on right now is around data governance. So you know, nice light topic to start off our master plan with. Um, but the idea is really to, to make sure that we're not just shying away from these big topics. So other topics that I've been looking at are aging in a smart city, um, everyone's favorite autonomous vehicles, what does that look like? Um, looking at accessibility, looking at the environment, looking at all these big topics and, and either having conversations, workshops, demonstrations. 
it's also an opportunity because I get to see all the coolest technology, but I think everyone should see what's out there. So rather than just me seeing it by myself, we can share it with the public and we can all see what's going on around the world. Um, so this is basically ongoing engagement that will just be happening um, throughout the lifetime of our, of our Smart Cities program. So, um, sorry, I was just realizing that, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so uh, governance is of course really important as part of the process. Um, it, it's one of the areas that is incredibly important. It's like the DNA of a smart city project, but it's really difficult for people to understand. Data is so esoteric, it's so far out there and it's so hard to understand how it's affecting us. So we really wanted to make sure that the public was involved um, because we're going to be creating a smart city policy. So right now I'm actually in the midst of a series of three events um, around bringing the public in to help us create our, our um, data policies. And then next week we actually have a big workshop where we're working with the public to start to create those, those principles that will become part of our policy. So I really want to make sure as I'm working with these huge uh, corporations, with different organizations, with different institutions, that we're really bringing forward the values of the community within that policy. Um, we're also looking at a lot of digital inclusion. Going back to that, it's a smart city for everybody. Um, so we have programs with our live. Our library is a huge partner for us because they're really connected to the community and they're really a great place to work around inclusion. And then we have partners like the United Way as well uh, to really work on things like laptop lending programs for people that can't afford to have a laptop or the data that goes with it. Um, or uh, education programs through the library to have skills building as well. So these are kind of programs we'll be working on as well. So, um, and also the infrastructure and citywide projects. I mean, so those are all very sort of localized and community based, but of course there's also all the big things coming. 5G is coming. Um, we have an advanced traffic management system to control the traffic around the city. We have an internet of things network around the city. So there's a lot of projects that are really citywide across the whole city, and we also are involved with those projects as well. The way that we work in our city, every city sets up their Smart Cities program a little bit differently. So I work through the IT department, some people work through city managers, some people work through other places. But we're really setting ourselves as almost an internal agency a consultancy that goes and works with all the different departments. Um, so there's specific projects that I work on, and then I also consult on other projects across the organization. And so going back again to how it would be governed, because this is um, an important process. So we will have the principles, the policy. We'll have an internal steering committee. So in Mississauga, our mayor and our council and our, um, our leadership team are all invested in Smart City. We have not, we were very surprised when we went to council, we didn't have any pushback. We had very few questions. Uh, people are very supportive in our, our, our um, city about this. Uh, this initiative, so we've had a lot of support. Um, and then we'll also have an internal community of practice with all of our, our experts that work in the city, and then the community will be involved as well. So then, this is just kind of the last little bit, is really again reminding us of who's it for, because there's, again, there's all these great technological advances, and they're, they're, they're really cool, and there's all these like internal city systems that, of course, we need to follow, and lots of bureaucracy, but, but we always need to remind ourselves that this is for the humans that live there. So we created some scenarios to just remind us of who we're building our smart city for. So our smart city is for people like Amira. So Amira is a student. Amira uses our, our Wi-Fi when she's on the bus. Sometimes, you know, we all had that last minute assignment. We were trying to get in on our way to school so she can do that while she's there. She uses our library system as a place to have her group assignments and to get her homework done as well. We've got people like Steve, so we all love Steve. But so Steve is a single dad, and he's sort of struggling with his kids. Doesn't have a ton of money, so for him, there's opportunities like that laptop lending program I was talking about. So he gets a laptop, he gets Wi-Fi, he can upgrade skills, look for work, but also use it for his children for their homework. Because as we know, in schools these days, um, kids that don't have a computer at home, it makes it a lot more difficult for them to do their work. Um, and so we're using these programs and using programs like working with United Way so that they can help us find who these people are and make sure we have the right matches for our programs. Smart City is for, oh, 
people like, we're not quite at a cool yet, for people like Rose. And I think often when we think of smart cities, we don't think of our older populations, but when you think of accessibility, connection, isolation, inclusion, it's really important for us to think of, of the, our older adults as well. So Rose is in a wheelchair, so throughout, so right now in Mississauga, we have one wheelchair charging station, but we're looking at having more. When we were working with our um, accessibility committee, one of our members who's in a wheelchair was saying that sometimes what will happen to him is he'll be around the city and he'll run out of juice in his wheelchair and he's just kind of stuck. And so this was something that we thought, oh, well, this is something we can do something about. Um, so these are the kinds of things, just making life accessible and easy for everyone that's in our community. Um, so Rose also uses the library. She's still involved in a book club. She uses it to get her e-downloads so that she can read them. And a lot of older adults find that things like iPads are great to read on because you can change the size of the text to whatever you need to read. And then finally, Akua. So Akua is a new Canadian. He's just moved to Canada. And for him, he's looking at um, using our library system and, uh, and our economic development. So for us, our economic development has offices and programs within our library system. So he can access those programs there. Um, and then also upgrade with skills that, um, that are offered by both the library and our economic development system. So at the end of all my presentations, I really like to give people a challenge. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, as this mentions, you know, growth is inevitable and desirable, um, but destruction of community character is not. The question is not whether your part of the world will change, the question is how. This change is happening. We can't turn back the clock and become undigital. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. So our choice that we get to make is what do we do with it? How do we use this as opportunity? How do we maintain the character of the communities that we're in and support the people that live here and really use this as kind of a superpower within our communities? Um, so this is my information. If you have any questions, you can email me there. There's a dot, uh, or there's an ad after the foyer there. <laughs> and then at smartcity.ca, uh, mississauga.ca, you can see our master plan there if you'd like to see the direction that we're going. Thank you very much.